Good afternoon. I'm excited to welcome you today to our second presentation for the series Envisioning Our Future for Children. I am Mark Rothenberg, Professor of Pediatrics to develop and the Division of Allergy and Immunology's Director here at Cincinnati Children's. I will be the moderator today. This webinar will be recorded and will be archived for online viewing in the future. If you have any questions related to this session, please enter them in the question and answer section of Zoom. You can access that at the bottom of your screen. We will answer as many questions as we can, but please be aware we might not get to all questions. If you have any technical difficulties, you can use, also use the Q&A feature to contact our administrators. Today, we are thrilled to introduce our speaker, Dr. David Alstruer, who will be discussing humanizing drug discovery. David Alshuler, MD, PhD, is the Executive Vice President, Global Research and Scientific Officer at Vertex Pharmaceuticals. Dr. Alshuler leads Vertex Research, preclinical and pharmaceutical sciences aimed at discovering transformative medicines for the treatment of serious diseases. He also oversees functions for innovation and data strategy and solutions and is the vice chair of the Vertex Foundation. For those unfamiliar with Vertex Pharmaceuticals, this company focuses on mechanism-based therapies that have transformative impact on the unmet needs of patients with a variety of diseases, particularly those genetic in nature. The best example has been the introduction of a new class of medicines to target the genetic variants in the cystic fibrosis transmembrane receptor. Prior to Vertex, Dr. Alstruler was a founding core member, deputy director, and chief academic officer at the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT. He was also a professor at Harvard Medical School and a physician at the Massachusetts General Hospital. His academic laboratory led, the three, major, led three major projects that have characterized and cataloged human genetic variation, the SNP consortium, HapMap, and 1000 genome projects and he pioneered methods and practice of genetic analysis of common human diseases. The Obama White House administration named Dr. Alshuler a champion of change for his leadership in creating and leading the Global Alliance for Genomic and Health. On a personal level, I know David from overlap at Harvard Medical School when we were both in training. As a molecular scientist embedded in genomic research, my own laboratory has greatly benefited from the advances of David's science and technological contributions. I draw your attention to his recent New England Journal of Medicine article, a pioneering paper using CRISPR-Cas9 to edit successfully hemoglobinopathies. This paper and others emanating from Vertex under David's supervision provide foundational approaches to treating diseases. David and I also share a common interest in food allergy. Without further ado, Dr. Alshula, please go ahead, unmute and share your screen. How pleased I am to be here today, because uh, from the time I was a medical student with Mark over 35 years ago, um, I have been compelled by uh, diseases uh, of genetic nature and in particular diseases of children. And uh, while I'm excited to come here today and share with you some of the work on uh, cystic fibrosis and sickle cell disease, it is the work of children's hospitals like Cincinnati Children's uh, that really uh, every day uh, makes a difference in the lives of, of families and children. And so it's a real pleasure to be able to come today and celebrate with you uh, in this uh, seminar series. All right, so the story begins actually uh, back when Mark and I went to school together. Uh, my story begins, I'm gonna tell you on, in August of 1986, I entered medical school and they handed us a pamphlet, a book written by uh, a famous doctor, Francis Weld Peabody, and it contained the following quotation. One of the essential qualities of the clinician is interest in humanity, for the secret of the care of the patient is in caring for the patient. Now, I have to admit, as a 20-year-old, uh, 21-year-old, entering medical school, I didn't really understand why this was important. It seemed to me everybody must be focused on the patients in front of them and on caring for humanity. But, and while that was true for doctors, I think that actually science had taken an interesting turn. And as an illustration of this, I'm gonna share with you on the next slide, a paper in the leading scientific journal, Nature, 
published a month before. I didn't actually uh, encounter this paper until many years later, but it was published a month before. And the paper was written on the occasion of the uh, now famous meeting at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories about human genomic science, human genetics. And at this meeting, Lou Kunkel at Children's Hospital uh, in Boston announced the identification of the gene for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And in addition, Stu Orkin, also at Harvard Medical School in Children's, published a, the first identification of a human disease gene um, for chronic granulomacies. And these were landmark discoveries. And finally, at that meeting, they also discussed whether or not, for the first time, the concept of sequencing the human genome. The first title, uh, first sentence of this article tells you everything you need to know. There is no scientific reason for studying man. That's the first article. And the article goes on to say that actually understanding the human genome and the genetic base of disease wasn't really worth pursuing because it was too complicated, would distract from other things, and mostly that what we needed to learn could be learned uh, solely uh, by studying animals and cells and not pairing that with human investigation. In fact, they went on to write in this article, because the genes had just been identified for Duchenne muscular dystrophy and chronic granulomatous disease, if the skill and ingenuity of modern biology are already stretched to interpret sequences of known importance, such as those of Duchenne muscular dystrophy and chronic granulomatous disease, what possible use could be made of more sequences? This turned out not to be true at all, what was written in this article 35 years ago. In fact, as you know, and as I'll describe, understanding the genetic basis of human disease in patients has actually led to many therapies that have actually benefited patients. And even in the case of that uh, listed here of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, there are people working today on genetic therapies for that disease, and there are approved medicines that all act through knowing the genetic basis of that disease. So why do I share this with you? Well, I share it with you uh, because it's very critical to the work that goes on at your hospital and, and around the country and the world that we understand where advances in human health come from. And I will argue that while all are founded on fundamental science, they also very often involve human investigation and therapeutics. So in my class, since I started the first three slides, and that'll be the end of the self-referential uh, portion about my own training, um, when my class returned for its 25th reunion, now almost 30 years later, because um, we had to go through the years of medical school before we could graduate and then have 25 year reunion, we actually did an informal survey of the class and asked what were the most important advances for human health uh, medicine in our 30 years at that time, six years ago, in medicine. And this is the list that people developed, an admittedly informal list, uh, not a scientific survey, but I think it actually is quite compelling. Highly active antiretroviral therapy for HIV, AIDS, and hepatitis C. Uh, those of us who lived through training during the period of HIV, AIDS being most problematic without those highly anti-active therapies know what a challenge, a true challenge uh, it was and what a difference those medicines made. Reductions in the rates of heart attack due to lowering blood pressure, lo blood cholesterol, et cetera. Obviously, re reductions in cigarette smoking, peptic ulcers, minimally invasive surgery, et cetera. Tight control for children and adults with type 1 diabetes. And what you'll notice if you look here is that of these, the majority are new therapies. They're new medicines. Now, why do I say this? Because um, while in some ways it may be obvious, in other ways, actually, I think the societal discussion about the importance of new medicines sometimes focuses on things other than how central new medicines are to tackling diseases for which we have no other approach. Often we talk about, and we should, changes in lifestyle, changes in environment, changes in behavior. Those things are all good. We talk about medical interventions. They're critical. But actually, often for certain diseases, especially those that are severe and genetic in nature, it is necessary to have some sort of therapeutic intervention to try and actually address the consequences. There's no other approach that will fully address that problem. So if you agree that new therapeutics are important, the question then is, where do they come from? And it's important to state that the discovery and the development of new medicines always starts with what I'll call a therapeutic hypothesis. That is an idea 
that modulating some component of a cell with a medicine might benefit people living with the disease. Now, initially, actually, where therapies came from was not so much uh, the therapeutic hypothesis being based on a cell, it was actually based on an observation from nature usually. Uh, for example, a plant extract, or people would discover an infection and then find a way to fight the infection. And the uh, later, the investigations focused on human hormones and physiology. That was uh, in the early parts in the first half of the last century, because those were the tools and technologies that we had to understand human disease. Now in recent years, it's actually become very fashionable in the last few decades to focus largely on models of disease rather than patients as the source of new therapeutic hypotheses. And at the same time that that's been going on, it's also become true that actually the efficiency of discovering new therapies has actually declined rather than going up. Now there's lots of reasons that actually the amount of effort and time and cost to discover a new medicine has become uh, more challenging over time. Some of that is a high bar for regulators, which is a good thing to make sure only medicines that are safe and effective can be used. Some of it is of course, uh, based on technology or medicine, but a lot of it I'm going to argue is actually based on turning our head away from the patients in front of us as a source of hypotheses through human investigation and human genetics, but rather actually focusing on model systems as the sole or main source. Now, why is it that it's so hard to develop a medicine and why is it so important? Well, it's because our knowledge of the human biology and the human biology of disease remains limited. Despite all the progress we've made, if we ask, why does somebody get asthma? Or why does somebody get obesity? Or why does somebody get a mental illness? The answer is in most cases, we still are trying to figure that out. We have clues, but we don't always know the answer. The second is, even in those cases, where we actually have a insight into human disease, such as uh, the gene for cystic fibrosis or the underlying cause of an infectious disease, we don't necessarily have the therapeutic technology needed to address that problem. Third, it's challenging to predict when, the when for first time a therapeutic technology with an underlying hypothesis is brought to patients, it's hard to predict the full potential for both benefits and risks because of the limits of our knowledge. And finally, it takes many years to develop a new hypothesis, to evaluate a new therapeutic approach, and then to test it in patients. In fact, I have come to believe, having spent now 35 years in medical science and the last uh, six as the chief scientific officer of a biotechnology company, that it is a remarkable thing when we do get new therapies, that the challenges are very great, and yet we continue to get them, but it's not something to be taken for granted. Now, the challenge is because even if you have a good hypothesis, there are many, many years and much work to be done to develop a candidate therapeutic so that it can be tested in patients safely to see if there's benefit. In fact, the cycle takes on the order of 10 years to go from having an idea based on an observation in patients or in the laboratory to develop a potential therapeutic so you can get to the point of testing whether or not it is safe and effective in patients. And the first time you get the potential answer is in what's called a phase two proof of concept study. The first time we see, does it work or not in an initial set of patients? And it turns out that 75% of all drug candidates in the industry that make it to proof of concept fail. And most of that is actually because they have inadequate efficacy for the patients. And the lesson that I've taken away after studying this for many years is that it's because if the target for the therapy is wrong, if the therapeutic hypothesis actually doesn't hold, then all the other decades of work and all of the work that's done to test that therapeutic hypothesis is doomed not to succeed because it's not the right therapeutic hypothesis. And conversely, if we can increase the likelihood that the therapeutic hypotheses we're pursuing are likely to play out for patients as safe and effective, then the other causes of failure, the other causes of drugs not working will uh, be what's left, but there'll be um, the chance of getting to success will be much higher. It's a very simple observation, but it's an important one, I think. So we focus very much on the role of the target in human disease rather than in models from a laboratory. And in particular, can we convince ourselves that the target 
plays a causal role in the disease. This is trying to get at the underlying cause rather than treating symptoms. Do we understand how variability in that target in nature and in people relates to the disease? Can we measure the activity of that target? And is the role specific such that perturbing that target, hopefully in a way that helps the patient, will not have any undesired consequences for other parts of the body or other times of life? So all of this is to say that human genetics, um, which is a way of connecting the underlying cause of disease to genes and proteins and potential drug targets, plays an important role in the discovery of therapeutics, if you accept the argument I've made. And this is a slide that summarizes 40 years of work by that many tens of thousands of people, because we have lived through an era where first starting with around the time of the paper I showed you in 1986, where human gene discovery first became possible. Over a period of 20 years after that, the causes of most single gene disorders or so-called Mendelian diseases uh, were discovered. And that pace has continued to today where the vast majority of all single gene causes of disease are now known in people. The more difficult case of common complex diseases like diabetes, hypertension, asthma, obesity, diseases where there's not one gene, but there's many genes, and it's not just uh, genes, it's also environment. Um, the tools and technologies to study those problems, which are harder to study, were developed about 15 to 20 years ago, building on the Human Genome Project. And uh, some of the papers of the projects I was able to lead in my academic laboratory are on this slide. But the real reward of actually doing work like this is seeing the elucidation of the genetic basis of common complex diseases. And I would point, for example, to the work that Mark Rothenberg has done at Cincinnati Children's and with his collaborators in eosinophilic esophagitis, which is a very important disease on its own and provides important clues to food allergy, including children like mine who have food allergy. And um, I wanna say that seeing the tools and technologies work across a wide variety of diseases and see people like Mark Rothenberg, who uh, introduced this talk, using those tools and technologies to figure out diseases is the best reward I could hope for, for having participated in any of this work. So how do you get from a disease gene to the idea of a therapeutic? And here, what we really do is make an analogy. And there's a paper that I published a number of years ago with colleagues building this argument before I moved to industry, actually, we wrote this paper. And the argument was quite simple. In a medicine, what we look for is what's called a therapeutic window. That on the left, you see if the, as the dose of the drug increases, the green curve is beneficial things happen. And hopefully that happens at a low enough dose of the drug that whatever potential for toxicities there are uh, do not occur. And this is called the therapeutic window. The, the, the distance between the amount of the medicine needed to have a benefit as opposed to a risk. And experiments of nature uh, can often inform this. And a genetic, uh, a genetic discovery can tell you that if the disease is caused by a target activity of a given protein moving from what is normally seen to less, for example, and that caused a disease that if we could boost it back towards normal, we should be able to make a medicine that actually would have a favorable profile. So at Vertex, that's what we try and do. We focus all of our programs, Vertex Pharmaceuticals, where I work, on trying to understand human disease or benefit, I should say, from the work of, of great academic scientists uh, to discover the underlying base of disease and combine that with breakthroughs in therapeutics to advance health by focusing on such validated targets and having assays and measurements in the clinic that actually read out those targets as a way of benefiting patients. So with that as a somewhat abstract uh, opening, I'm now gonna talk about cystic fibrosis. And I'm gonna tell you a story that was 20 years in the making. Actually, the story I'm gonna tell you is 70 years in the making, but I'm gonna focus mostly on the last 20 years of a set of scientists at Vertex Pharmaceuticals who've worked for 20 years to study the function of, uh, how to restore the function of the gene that causes cystic fibrosis. However, a period of time, they discovered four different medicines that are now approved for use. Uh, in mul multiple uh, regions of the world and how those have ha uh, impacted the lives of patients with cystic fibrosis. The story of cystic fibrosis actually goes back to the 1930s 
because that's when Dorothy Anderson, a pioneering uh, woman who was one of the first female uh, professors at an American medical school, discovered the disease cystic fibrosis. Dorothy Anderson was a pathologist and she was studying, uh, uh, performing an autopsy on children who were thought to have had celiac disease. And she discovered uh, scars in the lungs and dilations of ducts, cysts, and named the disease cystic, dilation of the ducts, fibrosis, scarring, and described how it was in the pancreas and also the lung. And with this discovery of the disease, because realize diseases aren't always known, we, people only know about them because they're discovered, starting now in the 1930s, it quickly was figured out that cystic fibrosis was a disease that was inherited from an autosomal recessive manner, and it had very serious consequences. Supportive care was developed to work on the nutrition, on lung disease, on infections, and the lives of families and children improved. And as of uh, recent decades, um, the cystic fibrosis had become a disease that could be managed through excellent care, but that still had a very major impact on people's lives. The disease has manifest with an interesting uh, characteristic that I will describe of salty tasting skin, coughing and lung disease with production of mucus leading to frequent lung infections and pneumonias that over time uh, have led to lead to lung damage. In addition, nutritional problems, poor growth and weight gain, and male infertility. And people with this disease spend uh, two to three hours a day on their chest therapy, take uh, eight to 10 different medicines, sometimes 30 or 40 pills. They're on average hospitalized 20 days a year. And unfortunately, their lives are shortened with the most common cause of death being lung disease. So this is a very serious disease that, that uh, is, is as familiar to many people, I'm sure, in this audience. In 1989, a key paper was published. This is three years after the paper I showed you at the beginning, describing the identification of the gene for cystic fibrosis. It turns out all patients with cystic fibrosis have mutations of some sort or another in the same gene called that became known as the CFTR, cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulatory protein, CFTR. And for those who are aficionados, and I don't know that, that for this audience it matters, the red, orange, yellow, green, and blue bars in the back of the young man with cystic fibrosis are the haplotypes at the CFTR gene. You heard Mark mention, and I mentioned the HapMap project, the haplotype mapping of cystic fibrosis actually was a key inspiration for the develop of haplotype mapping for more common diseases later. So the gene was found in 1989, and it was worked out by fantastic work in academia over a period of the next five to 10 years that what that protein, the gene encodes a protein, the CFTR gene encodes a protein, and that protein transports effectively salt, chloride ions, and there's a defect in the protein that underlies the disease. And remember I told you that the children with this disease, their skin tastes salty if you kiss them. And it turns out that is explained by this chloride transport dysfunction, the extra saltiness in the skin. But it turns out that lack of chloride transport actually explains pretty much everything about the disease. It explains the thick sticky mucus in the lung that leads to all the lung disease. It leads to the blockages in the pancreas that leads to the malabsorption and risk of diabetes. And it also explains the malnutrition. It also was worked out that there are multiple different kinds of mutations in this gene, making the problem harder. There were some mutations where the protein, this yellow thing that looks like a pumpkin, at the, gets to the cell surface where it acts to transport these little purple chloride ions. But the protein, when it gets to the surface, doesn't function. That's this category of what are called defective CFTR functional mutations. There are a set of mutations where no proteins made at all. Defective protein synthesis, the protein simply not made. But it turns out 90% of patients carry mutation that is a common mutation that has two defects. First, the protein is a defect in processing. It doesn't get made to the surface. And when it gets to the surface, it doesn't function. And this led to the idea, a theoretical idea, that if you could make a, a medicine that could turn on the protein at the cell surface that has a mutation such that it doesn't function and potentiate its activity, they were called potentiators in theory, you might be able to uh, help patients with this disease by restoring chloride transport. 
And even more uh, audacious to imagine, if you could make a small molecule, a pill that you would take that would go into the cell and somehow rescue the protein processing and trafficking defect of CFTR, maybe it could get to the cell surface where if you were lucky, the other medicine that could activate it at the cell surface might suffice to get it going again. Needless to say, these ideas were met with tremendous skepticism in the field. In fact, um, I'm gonna skip that for time. Um, in fact, uh, as Francis Collins, the current director of the NIH and one of the co-discoverers of the cystic fibrosis gene has said, many of us thought gene therapy would be the only way to treat this disease. In other words, bringing in a normal copy of the gene to replace what's missing. Um, but that has turned out to be very difficult and as of today, still not been achieved. But 20 years ago, my colleagues at Vertex started a project to search for small molecules, chemicals that could be taken by mouth that would actually increase the function of CFTR protein to see if this could be done. And that was done with a catalytic funding and partnership with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, a patient advocacy group uh, that still today is an incredibly important and positive force in cystic fibrosis. So I'm gonna tell you this story now in two parts. First, how they tested this hypothesis to see if it worked in patients. And second, how they got to the largest number, the larger number of patients who have that common mutation. These two stories actually developed in parallel, but I'm gonna tell them to you in series because it's a little easier to follow. So remember I said that there are a set of cell of mutations where the protein in this, in this diagram, this purple blob gets to the surface of the cell, but can't transport the chloride. And the idea was to find a small molecule chemical that could be taken by mouth that would actually open up the channel so it could transport the chloride. And you see this nomenclature G551D, and that is a mutation that actually has um, uh, that type of mutation of, of function. My colleagues discovered after years of work, a small molecule pill that could uh, increase in a dish the function of this uh, chloride transport. And in this video, you can see pictures of human cell, lung cells taken from patients with CF. And there's a wiggling you might sense in the background. And that's supposed that wiggling represents the normal function of these cells transporting, due to chloride transport, brushing away mucus and other things that could damage. But this is inadequate wiggling. When the medicine, due to the mutation, when the medicine is added, hopefully you can see on your screens a rapid wiggling. That is actually normal, restored by the Ivacaftor medicine, at potential medicine, and, and then with potential to help patients. So that was in the laboratory. And then the question was, would this work in people? And in 2011, this New England Journal paper was published showing the phase three data from treating people who had that mutation with this medicine. And what the y-axis shows you is increases in lung function and what the x-axis shows you is time. And you see that the people on placebo with cystic fibrosis, their lungs didn't improve. People on Ivacaftor, their lungs did improve. Moreover, we've now studied people with this, uh, take this medicine over a period of years who have been on the medicine in registry data from real world evidence. And you can see that taking this medicine is associated with a decrease of, of 50 to 60%, that's two different registries, one in the US, one in the UK, 50 to 60% reduction in mortality, reductions in transplantation, hospitalization, and what are called pulmonary exacerbations or pneumonias. The reason this is important is it shows it's not just a short-term benefit, it's a long-term benefit taking this medicine. But that was only, that medicine, which is uh, called Kaleidico, it's been on the market, uh, starting in 2012 and, and is now available uh, for children down to the age in the U.S. of six months, um, uh, been approved, uh, is only for a subset of people of that mutation. And it's a small subset. To get to the majority of patients, we needed to be able to, to address the more common mutation called Delta F508. The diagram here just reminds you that that mutation doesn't get to the cell surface, the protein doesn't get to the cell surface. And when it does get to the cell surface, it doesn't transport. So there were two problems. And the idea that Paul Negolescu and his colleagues came up with was to find one medicine that would get the protein to the surface. And the second that would be the potentiator, Kaleidico, to try and open it. This is the data from a paper published in the journal 
in 2017, which is 16 years after they started the project. It's the same x-axis time. The y-axis again is a measure of lung function called FEV1. And you see it, a acute increase with the first generation of medicine, something this is something called a Simdico or Tezacaftor or Ivacaftor, combination of two medicines. And you see a increase in lung function, but for those who are following closely, the y-axis, instead of being 10% FEV1 as it was with Clydeco, is 3% to 4% FEV1 increase. The reason for the smaller increase is because it's much harder to solve both those problems for Delta F508 than it was the one problem for G551D and only partial rescue and function was obtained with this first generation medicine for Delta F508. So we went back starting in 2015 and focused on, could we find a third leg to the school? If two legs, Tezacaftor or Lumacaftor and Ivacaftor were needed to get that level of benefit for Delta F508, could we find a third leg of the stool that would further encourage function to be able to address a larger number of people who had one or two copies of this Delta F508 mutation? And here a heroic effort at medicinal chemistry was performed. My colleagues uh, in our Vertex laboratories first discovered that third component, but then through over five years of optimization and over 25,000 cycles of medicinal chemistry, we're able to find small molecules that could actually as a third leg uh, uh, support higher function. This is the in vitro data, similar to what I showed you before, adding the three medicines increases chloride transport. And on the y-axis from the New England Journal in 2019, increases in lung function and the y-axis here goes to 14% or higher instead of the three or 10% because of the additional function uh, that is able to be obtained. And this is also true for people who have only one copy of this mutation. So I've taken you through that story and I know I'm supposed to wrap up, so I'll wrap up just in the next couple of minutes, but there are a couple of lessons I'd like to just take away from this. The first is that uh, this entire program was based on the human genetics of the disease, identifying the underlying cause in people, and then finding new therapeutic approaches to uh, replace what nature had taken away. The second lesson is that people thought that this so-called genetic medicine or precision personalized medicine would result in a subdivision of patients into different groups where each mutation would have its own medicine. And in fact, in our CF journey, there was a period of time where that was true. But having now found a triple combination that works for the vast majority of mutations, it's actually back to a single medicine for 90% of patients. So that's an interesting uh, thing we could discuss. And finally, lessons learned, and I'll stop here at this point. Um, what did we learn about disease and biology in general? Well, one is that tackling the underlying cause of disease with insights from human genetics and biology can be a very successful strategy, but it's necessary to invent new therapeutic approaches rather than be constrained by dogma. My colleagues at Vertex, this is before I joined, so I take no credit for it, were told for decade, this could never work. Small molecules could never improve the function of a mutant protein, but they had data and they followed their data and it turns out now uh, to be something that benefits patients. We moved forward multiple approaches in parallel to maximize the chances of success. This is different than how most drug discovery works where people go in series one at a time and then fall backwards if it doesn't work. We learned a lot from our early clinical data that allowed us to iterate, to improve from first in class to best in class and I do wanna just uh, make sure to say before I turn it back over to Mark, that partnering with patients and doctors and communities is absolutely critical. I will show in this last slide, and this slide's a little out of date, this is two years ago. We have performed over 155 clinical studies in CF with over 400 clinical trial sites around the world, 22 different countries, and in a disease where there's perhaps 80,000 people who have this disease uh, that we're aware of, 14,000 people have participated in Vertex-sponsored clinical trials. So if you've ever read about rare diseases and people studying 10 patients or 20 patients, we've done a series of programs with 1,000 people, placebo-controlled, randomized trials. We've done them rapidly, and we've done them to make sure that what we can offer patients is safe and effective and as a solid evidence base. And I hope that these examples, and perhaps in the Q&A we can discuss, uh, do have potential for other diseases we are working on at Vertex, like sickle cell disease, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, type 1 diabetes, and others, and the work of others around the world. So with that, I'll stop.
and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, David. That was extraordinarily uh, interesting and inspirational to us here at Cincinnati Children's. Reminds me of a talk I went in 1999, and it was uh, talked by Ron Crystal. It was uh, entitled The Genetics and, and Therapy of, of Cystic Fibrosis. And he said, you know, it's been 10 years since we discovered the uh, gene for CFTR. Um, and uh, I'm going to now show you the, uh, the treatment of the disease, uh, all the data about the genetic treatment. And the slide was blank. There was nothing there. Um, I think that was a good point. But I think what it also emphasized, at least to me, is how the investment in science takes a long time. And, and it's the basic science that, that, that ultimately led to all these beautiful discoveries uh, that you talked about today. So that should um, be particularly inspirational here at Cincinnati Children's where we have the research foundation that's dedicated to all levels of research. I wanted to start off the questions today with uh, one um, of my own, David, and, and basically talks about um, a comment you made earlier about Mendelian diseases being um, primarily mapped and deciphered. So I wanted to ask you, what do you recommend for the thousands of unelucidated rare diseases where workforce similar to that that you described that was engaged in CFT is not available? And this segues into the general question uh, about predicting the future of medical research and, uh, and, and how it will impact pediatrics. Please. Sure. No, thank you, Mark. I think that, um, first of all, um, I, as I've gotten older, I've come to take a, a slightly longer view of history. I mean, I'm less, I'm less impatient. Um, and what I mean by that is, um, as I look at the history of therapeutics and the examples I gave from my 25th reunion and the things that are happening now, not just CF, but muscular dystrophy, spinal muscular atrophy, uh, immuno-oncology and cancer, COVID vaccines, there's so much evidence that basic science, studying the cause of disease and working out fundamental biology combined with new therapeutic approaches really can uh, have dramatic and positive and even rapid impact on human health. But the reason I say I'm more patient is because in any given disease, it's hard to predict when it will happen. It's sort of a perfect storm of an insight that can become tractable and can be moved forward. So in general, I'm very positive. I think you raise a, a, a great question, which is about the thousands of single gene disorders that have been, uh, the causes have been identified. There are no doubt others we don't know about, but the vast majority, at least the underlying genetic cause has been found, but the, for very few are there therapies of the sort I described. And here I think that, um, you know, while we're still in the early days of genetic medicine and being able to provide genetic therapies, I do think in the long run, genetic therapies will offer, and by that I mean actually therapies aimed at, for example, the DNA change using gene editing or gene therapy, will offer a more uh, generic approach perhaps to individually rare conditions that are in, in and of themselves, uh, not, don't have enough people who suffer from them to necessarily attract the funding or the scientific interest or necessarily um, the, the funding, the, uh, the uh, attention they need. So I think that the point I'm making, this may not be obvious, I know it's a broad audience, so I'm gonna make sort of a, a high level science point, which is when you make a small molecule pill, a chemical, that uh, works through a protein, um, everyone is different. There really isn't a generic approach. It's uh, there's some, you know, people sometimes say, when you've seen one small molecule therapy for one protein, you've seen one small molecule therapy for one protein. Because the problem is every protein is different. It's actually the logic of biology is that the DNA is generic so that we can like store all the information in a generic way and the proteins are specialized. They go off and do specialized things. So I think that the idea of making small molecule pills for like every one of these rare mutations is probably too challenging for me to envision. But on the other hand, going in and treating the DNA, something that we're not yet so good at, we're just beginning. So I don't want people to think I'm saying in five years, in three years, in eight years, but the tools that are now being applied that are being successfully used for genetic diseases like spinal muscular atrophy or being used for Duchenne muscular dystrophy and others can in theory be applied to many different rare genetic diseases. And as the tools and technologies are worked out, I'm confident the pace will speed up, the investment needed for each of those very rare diseases will go down and that there will be better days ahead. But I think that's probably the path for the, if I understood your question correctly, the many thousands of individually rare diseases, each of which affect a small number of people. 
Thank you. Wanted to um, ask you a question that would be helpful to us as we're planning our strategy in terms of the hospital going forward is what do you think would be the unique contribution that we at Cincinnati Children's can make to the scientific and healthcare delivery innovations in the future, David? I'm, I'm really glad you asked that question, Mark, because I actually am a passionate defender of academic medicine, and in particular of institutions like Cincinnati uh, Children's that combine basic fundamental research into the biology and the cause of disease, um, invention of new potential approaches, clinical investigation, actually doing clinical research and caring for patients. So why is it that I think that's so important? Well, at, at first, uh, I would just say, imagine a world where such institutions didn't exist, where you had people doing basic science in mice and fruit flies. There were some other people studying diseases. There were some other people doing clinical research. There were some other people caring for patients. If you, if you divided the world that way, it'd be fine for five years. You know, like people who have gone to school together, they'd know each other. What happens 10 years later? What happens 20 years later? There will be no more therapies. The scientists will look at their, look at their navel gazing about science. The people who study disease won't know how to the basic science or how to cure it. And nobody will know the problem of the patient. Remember, I started my talk with the Francis Weld Peabody book that said, don't ever forget the patient in front of you. So now if, you, if the people listening say, well, we don't have to envision a world without those great institutions because they'll take care of themselves. Sadly, you're wrong. All right, the number of institutions that actually combine great basic science and big disease biology, clinical investigation and clinical care is small and shrinking. And I, couldn't, I don't know exactly how many children's hospitals there are in the world like Cincinnati Children's, but I bet I could count them on my fingers and toes, if maybe just my fingers, all right? And so it's incredibly important that we nurture and maintain those relatively few places, not only where new discoveries can be made and the best clinical care can be obtained, but also where people like Mark and myself can grow up. If we had not actually worked together, I mean, ourselves worked with our mentors and be able to bounce between uh, you know, the clinic and the lab, we would not be able to do the work we do today. And so again, don't take for granted, those of you listening, that it will exist. It only exists because institutions like Cincinnati Children's actually are, are the fertile ground for new discoveries and the next generation. Thank you. Related to this question, something that's coming from the audience, but it really relates to this particular question about your recommendations for Cincinnati Children's. Given the needs um, that you describe and our institution, our institution's strengths, what type of key collaborations do you think that you would recommend for us as we consider the future of genetics and personalized medicine? No, it's a great question. I mean, the first thing I would say is make some decisions and build on strengths. So what I mean by that is um, you can't, nobody, no institution can be everything to everyone. And in fact, at, at Vertex, we focus on a relatively small number of diseases with a strong genetic or human basis. We don't do everything. And sometimes people say, why don't you work on X? And I go, well, X is very important, but we think we're best positioned and best able to contribute with Y. And I think that, so I think Cincinnati Children's obviously knows for itself better than I do, you know, what are those strengths? And I would, I would sort of say, not limit yourself, but say where we have strengths of people and of expertise and of uh, capabilities or, or patient uh, groups that are engaged with us, think what collaborations then would enable you. And it may be, I think that goes in two directions. I would say to study a disease, and I'll, Mark, refer to your work, your excellent work on eosinophilic esophagitis. Those are not, I am sure, all patients you care for directly or in your institution. You've built collaborations around the world to have enough patients and to understand the generality of your findings. So one type of collaboration is when you pick a disease or an area where the institution has expertise, collaborate with others to build the necessary patient databases uh, because your expertise at Cincinnati Children's more than having every patient yourself, which of course you never will, will be what drives it. And then I think the sweet spot for such institutions, with the one I used to be at and the one you're at, Mark, is obviously everything from the basic science to understand the, the disease and the, the, the components you discover up to the pathophysiology, how it causes disease, potential therapies. And I do believe, and this is not just because I work at a company, it's actually why I work at a company, is I think that the development of serious therapeutics that are really going to change people's lives, 
actually goes on best in the in the in in companies because it's a highly team-based activity that requires lots of capital, lots of time, uh, and people working together across disciplines in a way that's actually, I think, impossible to do outside of war kind of situations uh, in, in the public sector. And I'll just give you an example. Paul Negulescu started this project in 1999 at Vertex. We have invested many, many billions of dollars over the years. There have been thousands of people who work on it. We've developed four medicines. You saw 155 clinical trials. This is not the kind of thing that you could do in an academic lab. And so where I think the Cincinnati, but, but a place like Cincinnati Children's can be the, the catalyst that sort of between you know, the, the disease in the world, figure out the disease, the lens, obviously care for your patients and have an interplay. That's the rapid learning. And then when it comes to a real therapy, I think working with companies is the way to go because I don't think any institution, no matter how big and successful, can, can do that itself. Thanks, you. There's a question from the director of our oncology program, John Prentices. He says, awesome talk, but he also asks, um, what do you recommend on approaches to target undruggable targets? And yeah. An example of RAS transcription factor. Absolutely. I, th I appreciate the question. It's actually very central. Uh, to what we do. And so just for the audience, the term undruggable target refers to typically a protein that we don't have a way to make a small molecule chemical to fix. And um, that's a little circular. And in fact, over time, meaning that if someone then figures out how to do it, it becomes a druggable target. And in fact, in the history of, of medicines, uh, originally there were, you know, you could only make a, a target, uh, the only targetable uh, types of, of proteins, uh, druggable pro targets, I should say, were like enzymes. And there were types of proteins that called kinases, and they were not druggable. And then people figured out how druggable. Now they're druggable. Cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator, CFTR, was an undruggable target until my colleagues figured out how to drug it. And so I think one of the great uh, frontiers for small molecule drug discovery is drugging the undruggable. Uh, and uh, we actually have a lot of projects like that where we say, is there, if there's a fundamental sort of rule of physics that said this could never work, we shouldn't start. But if there's a case where no one's figured it out yet, and the examples you gave uh, in the question of, of uh, the RAS or MYC, uh, these are longstanding cancer genes or what are called transcription factors that turn genes on and off. Um, do I believe they will become druggable with time? I absolutely do. And I think that um, the, the, that what it requires is a mix of great medical need, like the examples that John gave, but also really innovative chemistry, structural biology, and bio, biophysics to try and figure out how do you figure that out to, to do it. And I would say what we've learned from our CF medicines and some other programs we have is that small molecules that you take by mouth, the chemicals they contain, can do things that the textbooks say they aren't going to happen. Not because the rules of physics are violated, just because um, it turns out that uh, there are little binding, for the geeks in the audience, there are little binding pockets on proteins that we don't know about. And it's possible to find a small molecule that fits in there. And the tool, one tool that's very helpful in this is cryo-electron microscopy, which is a new approach that was won the Nobel Prize a few years ago of how to take pictures of much bigger, more complicated proteins. It's allowing us and others to see how some drugs work in new ways. And the other is just an open mind. My colleagues at Vertex would never have found these CF medicines except they were uh, creative and idealistic and perhaps naive enough to believe they could find something that other people told them couldn't be done. And when they found it, they then figured out how to iterate on it, learn, figure out how it worked and do it again. So I think John's question, uh, uh, I, I, I've become in my post-clinical career more informal. I refer to everyone by their first name. I hope you don't mind. You can call me David. Um, but, um, but I think that uh, it's a great question. And that's where medical innovation will come a lot of the time is some clinician or scientist who's really committed to a protein that no one's figured out in a company how to drug figures out how do you drug it then you go and figure out how to make a real medicine. It isn't just drug it, but has all the properties you need. Thank you very much. A question from Amal Asad in Allergy and Immunology. Thank you for inspiring, for your inspiring presentation. Much credit goes to the researchers, and in this case, cystic fibrosis. I think the credit goes to the CF clinical centers and networks that have recruited and shepherded patients through these trials. Can you comment on how to build similar networks for other diseases? Yeah, it's a great question. And first, I just want to uh, agree with the, the, the questioners 
uh, uh, underlying belief, comment, which is that, that the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and the scientific researchers deserve credit, but also the CF clinical centers, which figured out how to take care of these patients even before there were such medicines. And then the clinical trial network, the TDN, that was developed by the CFF and those clinical centers. These are absolutely foundational and we would never have been able to do what we did without them. And that the comment, how do we do this in other diseases, I think is one of the critical things for the future and, and also achievable. So let me be clear, I actually am quite passionate about this, which is um, it's, un, it's very unusual the extent to which the CF community was self-organized by a combination of parents and patients, of physicians and care centers, philanthropists, and ultimately the companies then, not just our company, but all the others who have worked in this field, all work together. And the reason we were able to bring Trikafta, that's the triple combination, what it's now called, from first discovery of the third component to launch in three years and seven months, which is eight years shorter than the industry average of 12 years. And you say, how did we do that? Well, we worked very fast on our end. We parallelized and did a bunch of stuff. But because of this CF clinical trial network, and because the patients and the doctors and the and the investigators were also well organized, the trials were able to enroll very quickly and effectively and expertly, and we got answers quickly. And when I look at the other diseases we work in, like the cystic fibro uh, sickle cell disease, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, type one diabetes, and some other adult diseases that we work on, um, those networks generally don't exist. And they certainly no one exists as well. And I think, you know, Mark, I should have said when you asked me the question, what about the many rare diseases that, uh, you know, uh, want to move down a similar path, one of the things they can and should do is build networks often across the nation because no one site has more than a small number of patients because it's rare. And I point you to my friend, Brad Margus. I don't know if you guys know Brad Margus. Um, you could invite him at some point to visit. Um, he, is, uh, the, he has many things. He is an entrepreneur. He's the CEO of a biotech company, but his greatest relevance here is he is the father, he is the founder of the, uh, AT Children's Project. He's the father of two children with ataxia telangiectasia, a very rare genetic disease. And he's been an advocate for that disease and rare disease research for many years. And one of the things he and I have spent time on over the years, and he and Anthony Filipakis at the Broad Institute have been working on, is building technical infrastructure on the internet to enable rare disease patient organizations and groups to build networks at the scale of the country or the nation so that when a promising new idea comes along, that it's possible to actually like rapidly or practically at least enroll a clinical trial. It's really not acceptable uh, if there are tens of 10,000 or 5,000 or 1,000 patients in the world with a disease and you can't enroll 20 patients in a study, but that work has to be done before the medicine is discovered, otherwise that becomes limiting. And so I think that is a great comment and question. And I do think uh, you might invite Brad if you're interested to come to some something and see if he can tell you about what he's done. Nice, thank you. You may not know this, but the CF Foundation has, um, one of the founders was Boomer Esiason and his son was uh, diagnosed with CF here at Cincinnati Children's. Um, and so, you know, a lot goes um, back to, to the contribution so made here. I actually have, uh, I have a football downstairs signed by uh, Boomer Esiason. I know his son, Gunnar, reasonably, I've met him a number of times, and they are an inspiration. Uh, they are really remarkable people. And um, reading the blog posts uh, that they have over their journey over the years has been an inspiration to many of us at Vertex. Right. There's one question left. Um, we only have two minutes, so we'll, we'll hold this to a one minute answer, but it's by Rafi Copan, the director of our developmental biology program. He asks in defense of uh, uh, model organisms, you talked about human research. Um, he wants to know what you, how you see model organisms fitting into the future. Yeah, no, I really appreciate the question because I do wanna be clear. Model systems are here to stay. Model systems are incredibly powerful and important. It's the anchoring to human disease that I was meaning to emphasize. So I think if you ask me, what is the role of model systems? Model systems, whether cells in a dish or a mouse or a fruit fly or a worm or a rat, are necessary research tools to ask refined, focused questions with tight control over all the variables and to learn how things work. Without them, we would be lost. What I was really trying to emphasize, and I hope I was clear, is that in the absence of the connection to the patient, 
we are untethered and it's too hard to figure out what hypotheses to test in clinical trials and what medicines to make. So I think animal models are here to stay, but I think that I encourage even better connection to the kind of clinical and genetic work to make sure we're focusing in the right place. All right. On behalf of our department chair, Dr. Tina Chang, who's a visionary behind this program, envisioning our future for children. David, I want to take this opportunity to thank you for speaking to us today. It was very informative and uh, we're very pleased to have you uh, provide this background information and share your knowledge with us. And we look forward to hopefully engaging with you in the future. Thank, thank you so much. And have thank a you for everything that's done at Children's. And uh, thank you, Mark, for your good work. Great seeing you again. Take care. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.